So good afternoon everyone. So it's a great pleasure for me today to have a, a guest, uh, Dr. Gerrit Hilgen, that is a great scientist. I work with him very nice and also he's a great friend. Dr. Gerrit Hilgen started as a senior lecturer at Northumberland University in May 2020. He gained his PhD in neuroscience in 2012 at, New at University of Oldenburg in Germany. And he has been employed since as a research fellow in computational neuroscience in the same university. And then as a research associate in retinal neuroscience in Newcastle University. He is interested in sensor, in sensory signal processing, neuroinformatics and anatomy with a focus on the mature and neonatal retina in health and disease and human pluripotent stem cell derived retinal organoids. Dr. Hilgen helped to develop UK's first experimental and analytical framework for light stimulation and simultaneous recording from hundreds to thousands of retinal ganglion cells, investigating various aspects of global retinal network function across the lifespan in mice and retinal organoids in health and disease. All his peer-reviewed publications span several disciplines such as neuroscience, stem cell science and neuroinformatics. During his PhD, he worked on electrical synaptic communication gap junction between mature retinal neurons using anatomical and single cell neurophysiological approach. When he joined Professor Sernagor's lab at Newcastle University, he moved away from single cell physiology and started recording from large retinal neuronal population, investigating various aspects of retinal network function across the lifespan. Over the years in Professor Sernagor's labs, he also became involved in projects related to retinal degeneration and repair. More recently, through a long-standing and fruitful collaboration between Prof. Sernagor's and Prof. Lacos lab at the Institute of Genetic Medicine, he has gained experience in electrophysiological characterization of human pluripotent stem cell derived retinal organoids which has promising application in disease modeling, advancing our understanding of human retinal development and cell-based therapies. His ambitious at Northumberland University is to build up an interdisciplinary lab that bridge neuroscience, molecular biology and computational approach to investigate the interaction between function, genes and anatomy in health and disease. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for this nice introduction. I start now my screen. Nope, thing should work now here. All right. So, one second. Think everything is visible? Yeah, good. Yeah, great. Thank you for this nice introduction and thank you for the invitation. Uh, to showcase our, our work here today. Um, I think there's some, some interference coming through. Okay. Um, so, yes, yeah, as Darren said, my name is uh, Gary Tilgen. I'm a senior lecturer at Northumbria University in Newcastle, United Kingdom. So today's talk is about understanding global retinal function for mice to humans. So before we start, I need to briefly introduce you to the retina, and maybe you remember that from Darwin's talk. Um, so the retina is the light sensitive tissue of the eye that lines the back of our eye cup. It converts the visual scenery into neuronal signal. It is a very layered structure, it's a flat structure. Uh, some say it's nature's brain slice, but I'm coming to that in this talk, why, why I'm saying that. Um, just very briefly, we have the photoreceptors are the light sensitive cells in the retina and they transfer their information further through the inner, inner retina where everything is processed. And the output cells of the retina are called retinal ganglion cells. And the retinal ganglion cells are particularly interesting for this talk today. So these cells 
integrate all the different information from from the inner retina and they send this uh, information in form of action potential or so-called spikes further to higher brain areas and this is can imagine like a barcode so it's it's a lot of information of zeros and ones going to the brain they are different type of ganglion cells and this is because the retina is not a camera the retina is a feature and change detector so we have specialized pathways that are detecting uh, certain features from the visual scenery for example something moving something dark something bright so and just to give you two examples they have the on and off cells so we will hear that here's that a little bit later in the talk so an on cell is responding to when something bright comes in their receptive fields while an off cell is responding when something dark comes in the receptive field And this is how a real retina looks like. In this case, this is a mouse retina, an explanted mouse retina, flattened out, and we're looking on top of the retinal ganglion cell layer. So the mouse retina is, in, has a, is around four to five millimeters in diameter. It has around maximum 50,000 ganglion cells. Uh, com compared to a human retina, which is much larger, it's three to four centimeters, and it can consist of one million ganglion cells. And if we zoom in a little bit here, you see that this is densely packed with ganglion cells. They are sitting um, uh, yeah, shoulder to shoulder uh, in the ganglion cell layer. And this is interesting because these cells are all spike and they send information. And it's an ideal, so the, the retina is an ideal model to study a spiking networks so or in general neural networks because it is a flat layer also. And this becomes especially handy when I'm now going to this slide. Um, so when we have these thousands and thousands of ganglion cells and these thousands of thousands of ganglion cells encode all the visual information that's sent to the higher brain areas you ideally want to record from as many as possible to understand the neural code the retinal code and you need the right tool to do that and in our case or in the past people started sticking electrodes into into single cells it gives you a limited resolution spatial resolution and then they started growing up as, as multi-electrode arrays where basically more um, recording sites um, available. And this ended more recently in the horizon of CMOS arrays. And these are arrays that use thousands of thousands of little electrodes that can sense the neuronal activity of neurons. And we used one that has 4,096 electrodes. This is, your, uh, this is the amplifier. That's a ship which just goes into the amplifier. And when you look into the shiny area, that is the actual CMOS chip. And when we zoom in this in uh, higher magnification, we see these little rectangulars, uh, these squares. These are the recording sites. And the retina, almost all of the retina is fitting on this area. It's, it's around 2.7 times 2.7 millimeters um, um, large. So and here we visualize these little red squares how dense the electrodes. And so this is like microphone sensing how these retinal ganglion cells talk with each other and how what they are sending towards the brain. And a little bit to further analyze it a little bit. Um, this, is a, um, this is a retina. And this is an example recording how it would look like when we do that with our recording system. And we also aligned this activity, and the activity is represented here in yellow dots. Each yellow dot is re representing one spike. We had to reduce the number of spikes to make it visible. And they are back aligned to their physically structure. So how I would explain later in my talk, but if you look now at that little movie, and I hope you can see that, you see how much information is processed over a large area. So this is ideally what we are interested in. And these devices are these large recording devices, they are now a quantum leap for neuroscience. And this brings me to my first project I want to introduce today. Um, it's a novel approach to the functional classification of retinal ganglion cells. This was in collaboration with, um, well, well, while I was still in uh, Professor Evelyn Zernagor lab at Newcastle University, um, and with our collaborators in INRIA in University of Kuta and Nice. As I said, you record from many, many neurons and you want to sort them, you would make sense of them. As I said, there are different features in the visual scenery that different ganglion cells encode. 
So how many different ganglion cells do we have? So this is still an ongoing debate. And yes, that's a question. Sorry, was there something? Not for Derek, you can go ahead. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Um, people pick up the microphone, please. The microphone, please. Okay, I'm just continuing now. Um, anyway, we how many ganglion cells we have is still under debate. We don't know. Oh, well, we have a roughly number. So this is three papers that uh, that try to solve that answer in in mice retinas. Um, so one was an early paper from 2006, where they worked basically anatomically, as you showed, there are around 13 types. Then more recently, Tom Baden and his crew um, showed that there are 30 different functional types of uh, ganglion cells. And really, just just a little bit more than a year ago, um, Josh Saints and his, his, his lab showed that there are at least 46 different ganglion cells in terms of gene so genetically uh, clustering. Um, this all mouse for humans and human non-human primates. We are around yeah up to twenty different ganglion cell types. So this is a similar number that recently found uh, were found also for humans. Um, I'm pretty sure that we, we, it may get more may go up in the in the future. Anyway. What we have now in mind is to combine these different methods, anatom uh, anatomy, genes, and function. And we do that by using pharmacogenetics, or so-called chemogenetics, and more specifically DREADS. And then the next slide explains exactly what this is. And then in combination with our large-scale high-density um, recording device. And then on top of that, uh, we want also to characterize these retinas um, anatomically by immune histochemistry. And as I said, DREADS, the DREADS stands for designer receptor exclusively activated by designer drugs. So these are a family of engineered G proteins, which can precisely control G protein signaling pathways. And these artificial receptors that you bring in into cell can be activated by an inert drug. That, that drug would otherwise do nothing in the retina or in the, in the, in the system. And once it's activated, they, um, in this case, we used an, a DRED called HM3DQ, which is called an excitatory DRED. Um, and this leads to a depolarization once activated with CNO. This is a drug, close upon an oxide. And this leads to a more spiking behavior, in this case, well, because we put it in, in the retinal ganglion cells. And just to hear a little bit of um, how it, the ideal situation looks like. There's a control recording, spontaneous, nothing happens. We add CNO, and these cells start spiking. And the idea was now to take genes, bring in these, these receptor, and then just classify all these, these, these types that share the same gene expression. And we started this project by choosing two genes. One is SCN1A, and the other one is Greek 4. We choose these genes because the distribution in the retina is very sparse. And that's what we needed to start with. First step was to quantify uh, that GFP. Well, I need to tell that these dread receptors do have a tech GFP mo molecule. So that's what we now need to quantify where exactly in the retina, in the ganglion cell layer, is it, are these cells. Um, so we looked at whole mound retinas. We mean we're looking on top of these retinas with the ganglion cells say, facing up. And then we quantified the distribution. And we found actually that the Greek four cells were more dominantly expressed in the in the dorsal temporal side of the retina, while the SCN1A are more dominantly expressed in the ventral nasal areas. So this was, first of all, interesting. And also we found out that the SCN1 cells are four times higher than, than the Greek 4 cells. Then we had a closer look at the immune histochemistry uh, of these GFP signals. So this is now a vertical cut through the retina. So we see here, this is a ganglion cell layer. This is the uh, inner nuclear layer where we have all the, the amacrine cells and bipolar cells. And here's a plexiform layer. So we see there's uh, what we expect, uh, this uh, distribution of cell types in the ganglion cell layer, but also in the amacrine cell layer. And I come in a second about what, what implications that has. We put several markers, so we are now focusing only on these ganglion cells now. We have, so we put several markers like path avenue, calretinine, these are known markers 
for retina ganglion cells. And we try to find out how many types, subtypes, are within the Greek 4 family. And we found for Greek 4 that we have at least three different uh, ganglion cell types. And for the SC1, we did the same, and we found that we have at least four different types. Great. So ideally, now our initial plan to activate the dread in the ganglion cells and take out the cells that did show an increase of activity um, was, yeah, is not working anymore. That was not working anymore because we know, we did, did know now that there are amacrine cells in the morph. And if amacrine cells have the dread and we activate these amacrine cells, they have an inhibitory or excitatory effect on the postsynaptic ganglion cells. So we would isolate cells, or that we would have cells that are actually not carrying the gene. So how to overcome that is we combine. Let's combine that. Let's combine. This was our initial plan anyway. We put the anatomy, also the immune histochemistry of the GFP information, combine it with the information about the activated red cell, and we combine it with the with actually re, with our recording system and with our light stimulation because we we want to present a battery of different stimuli to functionally classify these cells. Just very briefly how we did that is that we used the, the fact that these arrays, these high density arrays, uh, have their inter-electrode distance is very small. So we see the activity of one unit or one cell on multiple electrodes. And what we did is we, we looked at the spiking behavior and we looked a little bit before and after one spike at the voltage because these, these devices are, are recording voltage. And then we looked at all surrounding um, electrodes, what is going on in terms of voltage deflection. And this is a process called electrical imaging. And it allows you to identify electrogenic cells and networks very easily. And also it gives you, more importantly, um, an XY location of where your current sink is, or where your initial um, action potential was generated. And just to speed up a little bit these things, um, we, you can, we, we, we simplified it a little bit uh, with a method from our paper from 2017 by just looking at the spike amplitudes because we see the spike from the same cell and multiple electrodes, same thing like with the voltage. And it's imagine a room full of microphones and you stand in the middle to talk. So the microphone's closer to you, your voice is louder on that microphone. Further away, it is not so loud. So you can then triangulate that position in XY space. So this allows you to have a micrometer precision where your um, cell is. So we did that. We put everything together, our spikes, our leg, our current sink, and our GFP information. And we isolated, sorry, we isolated then the only the ganglion cells that did have a GFP. So that did have a threat expression in there. That was the goal. Only cells that were GFP positive and did show an increase of activity were taken further for, for functional clustering. And just as a side note, this technique is not restricted only to GFP and rats. We also tested it with standard immunolabeling against different colors. So it is highly, yeah, highly usable also for other systems, not only retina, but also neuron or brain slices or cell cultures. As I said, we took out the ganglion cells. We took out, we want now to know what kind of features they encode when we display different kinds of stimuli. And we did that by looking at the spike synchrony. What does that mean? So these are three different cells here, for example, and they are presented with three different stimuli. In the moment, it doesn't matter what kind of stimuli, they are just three different stimuli. You see cell A and B are responding almost in the same behavior. So at each of these lines represents one spike. Um, but cell number C is completely different. So this is sim more similar to each other than C, and this can be measured with this is called a spike distance measuring. Um, and uh, we did this uh, clustering, or we did this measurement in our 2008 paper. Basically, we calculated a spike distance matrix, and from that we calculated um, hierarchical clustering, and which is then used to construct kind of a dendrogram to group the cell responses, the different responses in different groups. Um, as I said, I don't want to go too much in detail. Just one flaw was it only works if you have, a, have an image or a, a stimuli that is static. That, has, that, that means 
the stimulus is presented at the same time to every cell on your recording side. So then you can do a spike synchrony. If you use something moving, then one half of the cell, well, one half of the cells is already excited because the stimulus is already there, where the other is not, and you can't really synchronize them anymore. So this is good if you if you want to classify only res uh, stationary responders, um, what we call cells that are mainly responding to something static. But there are also cells that are many of the cell types in the retina are really tuned towards motion, and they barely respond to, 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 to um, stationary images. So make a long story short, so we divided them beforehand, before we did this clustering, and it enhanced the cluster groups. We found for the Greek 4, we found four, four clusters, four response clusters for the stationary um, types. Um, and interesting, we found these, these are the unsustained picks on, and this was uh, a validation because in 2018, a group showed that these picks on encoder, it is called, uh, is Greek 4 positive. So we could identify these, these cell type, um, whatever, we could verify that. Same with the non-stationary cells. So these are the moving cells. We presented the same static stimulus again. Um, the, the responses are a bit uh, poorly. So the scale was raised up, but we found the on-off direction selective cell, which was reported in, in another paper, that this is Greek 4 positive. Great, this is how our system works. So we did that also with the SCN1As, and um, in the moment we found seven types of, of, of clusters for stationary or non-stationary, but probably the non-stationary will go down a little bit. I'm not going into detail right now because I think this is um, um, a bit bit too much into 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 retinal physiology. But this kind of classification method by using dreads works. And this brings me to the next, probably more interesting project. Um, which I want to introduce here. And uh, this is a project that I did together with Darin, uh, together while she was in Newcastle. And it's about transplanted pluripotent stem cell derived photoreceptors, precursors, illicit light responses in my system advanced de retinal degeneration. Before we start, I need to pace down now a little bit. So, retinitis pigmentosa is a, is a, belongs to a group of rare genetic ocular disorders. And these, these, these disorders, they have in common that they, they lead to a break, breakdown and loss of um, primarily photoreceptors first and other cells later in the retina. And so these common symptoms, when you have retinitis pigmentosus, include that you have difficulty seeing at night and you have difficulty seeing in the periphery. So this is a little example here. It should, could look like as an extreme example that your that your periphery is, is 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 blind while you have a center or tunnel vision. The why I'm telling that is these, as I said earlier, this leads to a breakdown of cells in the retina. So the retinitis pigmentosa leads to what we call retinal remodeling. And I need to tell I want to tell you what this is to to understand the aim of our project here. So that retinal remodeling is a pathway to cell death and a complete topo topologically restructuring of the retina. Um, it is similar to negative plasticity that occurs in the central nervous system pathologies like tra trauma or epilepsy, for example. It starts, it comes in phases. The first phase is um, photoreceptor loss, or that starts the photoreceptors here, starts degenerating. And this triggers already the early or the early remodeling effects. In green is the activity of um, glia cells. So these are glia cells in green. We need to have a look on them too. In phase two, it becomes already a bit more severe. You see that the photoreceptors are almost or already all gone. Just the remaining um, inner segments are, are there. Um, it's completely the Müller cells, the glia cells, are completely sealing off the retina from the choroid, from the blood vessel layer. So this is, and yeah, it's already quite severe. And then it becomes worse in phase number three. We have um, a completely restructuring, a de novo, or what we call de novo neuroid formation, because the inner retina, the bipolar cells, sprouting out to find new partners or finding new synaptic partners and it's all over. So it is a, a lot of crowded mess going on and 
This is accompanied with cell deaths, quite a lot of cell deaths. But surprisingly, when we look at the photo, um, the ganglion cells, they don't change so much. They're actually still there. And their dendrites are still more or less intact. And they're not really affected by this remodeling directly, more indirectly, in terms of what kind of input they get. One, once, one uh, very key uh, sign of, of this late stage is in this um, ganglion cells is this oscillatory activity. So when you become blind, you, your retina is not, or your, the retina output cells are not becoming silent. It's, it's the opposite. So you, they're becoming, they're freaking out. They're becoming extremely highly active. And not, not chaotic, highly active, very periodic right, um, oscillatory ac activity. And this is because of the um, uh, of the inner retina of the uh, amacrine cells that are that are the, the input is missing from 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 these cells. So why I'm telling you all this is now because well, gene therapy or treatment methods can only be 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 applied while we while the photoreceptors while the photoreceptors are still there. So if I want to gene therapy on photoreceptors, I need photoreceptors. The late stage, they are gone. So I can't do anything then. So the only method there is transplantation. So and our aim was, or the, can transplantation of pluripotent stem cell derived cones, in this case we used um, cones, preserve light responses in a late stage model of retinitis pigmentosa mouse retinas, so and it's, it's shortly called RD1 retinas, but this is a model for retinitis pigmentosa. And can we restore light, inf light um, information at that late stage by transplantation. That was our aim, and this is that abstract here, just uh, that you can follow the next step a little bit easier. So, first part was done mainly by, by Darin, and the second part, this part, part was mainly done by me. So, at day 90 of differentiation, uh, retinal organoids were collected and dissociated to single cells. And the cone cells, um, they, they carried a GFP, uh, GFP construct bound to a CAX construct. And they were isolated by using uh, fluorescence activated cell sorting, so FAX. Um, then we 100,000 of these cells were then transplanted by Darwin in the subretinal space of um, these mouse models, of these retinitis pigmentosa mouse models. So they are blind. These mice were. 10 to 12 weeks old uh, during the inner transplantation. And um, we also injected a control group or a sham group, so basically only with the carrier, um, where we were no photoreceptors, no cones in the transplantation, just the, 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 the cell line solution um, for control. And then we let these cells work. We waited three to four weeks, and then we took these mice to a behavioral test. And we did two different behavioral tests, and I'm coming to that in a second. And mice that were promising that did show a reaction in this behavioral test, where we think the vision was restored, were further um, uh, selected for, for in vitro recordings with our high-density multi-electrode system that I explained earlier. Because then we have a really a chance to map where the light responses are, how many light responses are still there. Step one, engraftment. So this was checked regularly, immunohistochemically, um, with um, how successful was the engraftment of the transplanted photoreceptors. So this is here, um, these are the GFP cells that were transplanted or injected, and they are close to the, to the host in the nuclear layer, and they, they are mostly, or are mainly found around the injection site. And then we have a closer look with uh, um, an antibody against G0-alpha, which is the staining the dendrites of bipolar cells. And these bipolar cells are supposed to make contacts to, to photoreceptors, and, and, and they transfer the light information further to, to, to the uh, ganglion cells. So that's what Darin did, and then we had a closer look at this Green cells, these are the native transplanted photoreceptor cells. And do we have some kind of, um, are the dendrites making contacts to these transplanted uh, cells? And 
you see by the arrows, yeah, they are close contact, obviously. We can only say it's in close contact uh, because we have a limited resolution, but it's likely that they form, that they have made contact. This gives good hope for our next step, the behavioral. So the light avoidance test is just quickly, um, you put a mouse in a box, one area is in the dark, one area is uh, shined with bright light. So mice don't like bright light. So if that mouse is able to see something, then they would avoid the bright area and would go into this little hole into the dark area. That was tested in the first part. So this is the, this dot uh, diagram. You see here, these are the transplanted mice. This is the sham. This is the, our control condition. And this is another control condition that were not transplanted, but were blind. So these, these two groups are supposed to be blind. And the dots, or the, the, how often they were avoiding the light is then calculated here as a percentage. So you see that these blind mice, they didn't really avoid that. They just stand where, yeah, in, in the bright light. So because they, have, they, they can't see anything, so it doesn't matter where they're standing. While the transplanted had a tendency towards moving into that little hole. Um, but you see also there's a huge variability in there, so that was not a really strong significance, or there was no significance. But these transplanted mice were then further analyzed with an optomotor um, system, which is a drum, and inside that drum is uh, are gratings moving in different directions with special different sizes and randomized. And if the mouse, if it would could see it would track these gratings and you you can see that you have a, a high resolution camera and you you are tracking the the the, uh, the head and eye movement and the same thing um, the our supposedly blind control group uh, versus the transplanted control group and this time we did see a significant difference between that these transplanted mice did show um, uh, yeah successful did show hect uh, tracking of their head while the blind mice did not. This was good, good. This was already good. So the next step was we take these mice that were promising and sacrifice them, take out the retina, put them put them on our MEA system and, and try to yeah, see in detail how these light responses on a cellular level are. And as I said, ganglion cells do have this oscillatory activity. Um, as a, on this, this is showing the, uh, the spikes, 50 repetition of, of this stimulus, basically black, gray, black, gray, black, white. So this was 50 times repeated, and you see there's a lot of noise in the background. You can barely see that, they are, that there's any kind of responses to the stimuli. And this is the problem if you, if you work with blind people or with, with, with blind retinas. If you use prosthetics, for example, um, it's difficult to overcome that noise, that background noise, and, and prove or have a significant or good signal to noise ratio to get your prosthetic induced signal to the higher brain areas. But there is something you can do. You can use a gap junction blocker. In this case, it's called MFA, uh, used for the micromolar. And if you apply that to the retina bar solution, you block the gap junctions of the inner retina. And this leads to, to a slowdown or silencing of these oscillatory effects. And then when you apply the same stimulus again, you see um, there are the light responses. They're quite strong light responses, to be honest. We did that. So we put all these promising retinas on our mirror. Um, we found what we found is we found conventional or classical uh, uh, light responses, like uh, like responses to on, very transient brief responses to, to bright stimuli. We found them the same to, to off, to dark stimuli. So this is textbook responses, but we found, and this is more interesting, suppressed or very, very, very crazy responses, but driven by light. And these are potentially and, um, because of new connections, and new pathways that this late stage um, restoration was inducing. So, for example, this is what we call unsuppressed off-sustained. So during light, there is no signal coming through. Once the light is gone, it goes bananas again. Same as the other way around. Uh, there's an off-suppressed or unsustained cell. So we have darkness, nothing happens, light goes on, and they start sluggishly responding to it. We did several tests with blockers um, to 
to block the, the clutter mate transmission and the, these responses were all gone. So we exclude here that there are any kind of intrinsic photosensitive ganglion cells involved because these, these responses were all uh, no, not all over. But this is the next point. We found these responses, any kind of light responses, either conventional or unconventional, only in clusters, which we unfortunately, or what, what we think are the representation of the injection site. And unfortunately, we were not able to look in the same method I described earlier to co-localize that with the GFP staining because these retinas were extremely fragile and they broke. So, um, But this is something that we will keep in mind for a future project that we align these light responses back to the injection, to the, to the transplanted photoreceptors. Bring this now to an end. So we found um, quite a diversity of different light responses in these uh, transplanted retinas. Um, most of them were conventionally on, off, on, off, uh, but also we have a, uh, a meaningful mass of, of, of unconventional, very interesting uh, uh, responses, and also some very basic motion responses so that they were uh, having a preference for a specific uh, direction of a stimulus. So yes, transplanted stem cell-derived photoreceptors can partially preserve light responses. And happily, this paper, or this project was accepted this week also in stem cells. So this is now a good way out. So bringing this to, end, uh, to, to, to an end, acknowledgement, um, need to thank definitely Evelyn and Ma Ma uh, Linda Larko, uh, Darin, of course, for working on this project, and Robert for the project I'm, I was showing earlier. And Bruno and, and Jenny to and all, all the people that are for the funders. Any kind of question? Sharing my screen. Thank you, Garrick, for the beautiful talk. So I know there's a lot of paper that are coming coming out that using this technique, the NIA, the several organoids like brain organoids. But do you know also if they're using uh, this technique in some other organ except for the organoids? Because I'm focusing on the retina like you, but you are an expert on the NIA. So in some other field that can be applied, the same technique that give a lot of information. Definitely. I mean, that's, um, I know from groups that you use it, obviously, on brain slides now, on brain tissue, but also on brain, brain weeds. Uh, so these are the, the, the ones that are used to, to generate mini brains. So every, everything that could potentially evoke kind of electrical activity yeah. uh, can be... Can, Device. Maybe also some muscle area, like some... Muscles, yeah, yeah. It, it, but the problem is the muscle is sometimes a contraction, but you could have, for example, renal tissue or some other tissues that, that have... I mean, you, you, you don't need to necessarily record spikes. Spikes are an extremely mm. deep polarization event, but voltage or the ion channels in every cell. So, and, um, it, and, and neurons are just specialized because they have these, these, these the voltage-gated... Um, yeah, to so make but, easier use. Yeah. So, but but sometimes you have also strong, and you can sense depolarization of a couple of millivolt with these senses, and and you could you could use this in a broad variety. Let's say this way. There's any other question from the audience? It was probably too fast. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be shy, guys. <laughs> Don't be shy, Marco said the same. <laughs> I mean, to me, it was a clear talk, of course, because it was part of the same field. Hope also for the, all the audience were clear and easy to follow. Let's give some... Just to highlight also the importance that these... MEA was developed at, uh, in, in Italy, actually, in, in Genova, in the IIT in, in Genova. So just to give a bit of yeah. credit so to, to Luca and his group. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> so, yes, 
So there's a question. So what do you think the maximum electrode density that you can achieve with MEA is? Uh, this is a good question. The, the limiting factor is the, the I mean, the, how much information you can transfer because you need always to data acquisition, you need to filter before digi the digitalization. So you need to apply these circuits in these little chips. And um, I think we are, there are ideas, clever people can, can scale that probably, you know, uh, a little bit more up, about 4,000. And, but I think then, then, with the current technology, I think we are almost at the end in terms of how much you can achieve similar recordings. So, because when we when we start these recordings with 4,096 electrodes, the information that we gather is around one experiment or the, one one of these experiments that we do with all these repetition for is around 500 gigabyte. So, so two 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 eyes per mouse is one terabyte data. So this is quite a lot of data that you have to store and process. So and this is um, hardware limited at, at some point. Um, but I'm sure there will come something soon. Uh, some more clever people that are working on this. There's also a lot of different software that you can use to analyze the data. Yeah, there's, there, there, you, I mean, it's, it's up to you. If you use the custom software, or you make your own software, you use only voltages, or you use um, only spike data or discrete data, so it's up to you what, what you're going to do with this data. So these data sets, once acquired, are extremely valuable. So because um, uh, just as from our example, that we work also with computational neuroscientists, and they work on data that we acquired seven years ago. They are still still happy with that. So, <laughs> so, oh, wow. so it's a bit of a gold mine at some point. If you're really into into number crunching and and, 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 and computational neuroscience, these data sets are probably very, very interesting. There's another question. So can you please expand a bit on relevant pathologies you are focusing on and how your studies will impact on them? Sorry for the naive question the Professor Teddy asked. <laughs> no, that's a good question. So that, 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 that's the other interesting part about the pathology. So, um, yeah, we now have the, 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 the retinitis pigmentosa model, that the mouse retina model that we used. We have also organoids that we, with these retinal organoids, like we can model every kind of ocular disease. So. Um, but we need always to 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 have a ground ground truth, and that's 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 something that I'm very interested in. Is it's not only when you when you make stem cells or retinal organoids, any kind of stem cells, if they look structural and functionally uh, structurally nice, it's okay. But function is something else because the synaptic uh, activity to is is is, is um, it's difficult to, 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 to establish. So we, in 2018, we, we, we published that paper with, where we did show there is some light responses coming out of these retinal organoids. Um, and then we tested something earlier with, with a, um, a retinal organoid model that has a retinitis pigmentosa too, but then was CRISPR, was we used CRISPR to restore the gene again and to make it see again. So that was tested again, so the light responses came back. Um, so there is some 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 advantage in using such a system for for looking at the function. If you have the if you have a, a model that has an output that you can measure on a flat surface, that's 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 the minimum standard. So that's some kind of a, that you can put on that, and then you can say, okay, maybe in a, I have a Parkinson um, brain slice, human Parkinson brain slice. And I want to measure that. What is different? What is how? how so, or, or you want to induce um, ictal activity in an epilepsy uh, biopsy, something like that. It's that, that that's a current thing that are ongoing in, in Newcastle. That uh, using this kind of systems and, and looking at the network level, and going away from only doing one thing. Just if you just look at structure. It's okay, but I bring structure, function, and anatomy in this key also genes together. It gives you a bit, big better. Uh, um, so my my personal research is going a little bit more in these ocular diseases, uh, and I hope to 
characterize them a little bit more on the cellular level. Not necessarily using only this, this Mayer system, but maybe also um, to use single cell approaches again, as I did earlier in my career, just to have a confirmation about cell-cell interaction. I think that also can be used this technique, especially for the drug screening, I guess. Yeah, phenotypic I think screening. that would be quite easy. I mean, take the term easy in the right way, because you can add, like in an organoid's brain or retinal or what else, add the different screen drug, and you can see how this will modulate. I'm just guessing. That's the thing. Is it, this is always uh, what we have is or precious tissue, for example. If you have a... If you have, I mean, this is a good thing about Newcastle that you, when you have people on the theater and you have the chance that they get some tissue out and, and, and then you can do, this is precious tissue that you will never get again and you want to record from many uh, samples as possible. There was a question about retinal yes. photoreceptor transplant. It's very yeah. expensive. Yes. <laughs> yes, definitely more than 1,000. <laughs> it's the thing is you need to first to have a, a stem cell lab. <laughs> facility. That costs you a good. And uh, Darren, you can comment on the price for these media. I think the initial media to differentiate, I think one bottle yeah, is around like 5,000 pounds. Pound per week just to keep alive the stem cell. And then you have to keep in culture for another three months. And then the single cell facility and then the animal facility. Basically, is a very exp that was a very expensive experiment <laughs> for both lab. Then we have another question. Could this method um, also be used to measure cell migration and invasion? Thing is, yes and no. Um, when something is moving, what I mean, normally cell you migration? don't. When you want something, um, when something is moving or when it's migrating, and then it's mm -hmm. difficult because you lose the contact. You always need need to use contact to the surface electrodes. And ideally, it should not move. So because then you have a stable recording, because once that cell would move. But other than that, if you have your output cells, let's say you, your cells that you want to measure are static, but your top cell, top layer cells, are, for example, dendritic integration or something like that. We, we did long term experiments in, an, in another project that we were able to record three days. So three entire days, so we really can see night, dark shifts, and 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 and, and. so we our idea was to to deplete in retina completely out of GABA and see what's going on. Um, so it was um, yeah, it's possible to do longer term, but do uh, you still your cells need to stand still? That's the that's the minimum. Mm -hmm. And also because the retina is ex vivo, so it's. <laughs> Difficult also is ex vivo explanted from the dead mice. Well, but case. still, so when you go for the yeah. development, when I did the development experiments, there's still development processes still going on. So, mm -hmm. not not ideal, yeah. but you can yeah. follow that over the days, critical periods. So that what uh, yeah, and you can see how it will decrease over the time. So. If there's another question, we have time for another maybe one or two questions. Otherwise, we just say thank you. Great. So, Gary, thank you very much for giving us this amazing, fantastic talk about your new project and about our paper. So, thank you for all the people that joined this uh, join this uh, webinar and the next webinar with the TMS group will be next Thursday same time thank you very much Garrett see you thank see you bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.